Hello and welcome everyone to a DuraSpace Community Webinar. My name is Christy Searle and I will be facilitating today's session. A few housekeeping items before we get started. For your convenience, there is a Q&A feature located in your menu. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions from our audience and we'll ask you to post your questions there at that time. Today's webinar is being recorded and both the recording and slides will be made available after the presentation at duraspace.org. We are pleased to have you with us today for an overview of Archives Direct. Joining us is Heather Greer-Klein, the Services Coordinator at Duraspace, and Sarah Romke, who is the Artifact Ar Archivematica Program Manager from Artifactual Systems. I will turn it over to Sarah to get us started today. Okay, um, thank you, Christy. You can hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to uh, give you uh, an overview of Archives Direct today. Um, so uh, this will be the agenda that we'll uh, work from today. So um, first we're going to talk about just the very basics. What is Archives Direct and what is Archive Vatican? What is Jira Cloud? The two, two platforms that are sort of supported by Archives Direct. Um, Archives Direct and how it can work for you, what kinds of problems you might be trying to solve that Archives Direct might address for you. We'll do a uh, workflow walkthrough uh, where we talk about what the, the workflow looks like um, in the Archives Direct uh, environment. And um, then I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Heather to talk about uh, the world of Duraspace hosted services. Sometimes there's some questions about the relationship between them and what the differences are and so on. And uh, then we'll have lots of time, I think, for questions and answers. So what is Archives Direct? Archives Direct is a hosted and managed version of Archivematica using Jira Cloud as backend storage. And in the next slides, I'm going to talk more specifically about what is Archivematica and what is Jira Cloud, in case you're not familiar with either of those, those platforms. Um, the service was launched in April 2015. It is um, managed by Duraspace, so if you uh, subscribe to the service, your contract is with uh, Duraspace, so that may be a, an organization that you're already familiar with, that maybe you have other um, contacts there uh, and using other services as well. And the support and training and consulting comes from us here at Artifactual Systems. So um, basically our, our users of Archives Direct are sort of assigned an archivist from our team here at Artifactual Systems. And uh, either uh, that person or other members of our team uh, help you with all of the technical support and, and training and so on that you need. It's sort of one of the benefits of using a hosted service is that um, you don't have to worry about things like uh, you know, troubleshooting or upgrades and so on. All of that uh, technical support is uh, provided with the subscription. And what it really provides for you is standards-based digital preservation packages in secure long-term storage at its core. There's a lot of different workflows that you can enact with Archives Direct in different ways that you can um, different ways that you can use the service. But at the end of the day, what you're if if this is what you really need, if you feel you need to, to be performing digital preservation and you want to be creating standards-based packages and putting them in secure long-term storage, then Archives Direct might be a good solution for you. So what is Archivematica? Archivematica is the front end of Archives Direct, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. But what Archivematica is, um, whether inside the Archives Direct environment or outside, it is a web and standards-based open source application which allows your institution to preserve long-term access to trustworthy, authentic, and reliable digital content. So Archivematica is used primarily to create um, OIS-aligned archival information packages. So if you're familiar with the Open Archival Information Systems reference model, then you're familiar with apes, sips, and dips, <laughs> and Archivematica, its, its core functionality is to take the content that you're trying to preserve and package it into AIPs. And it does this by performing digital preservation actions along the way, so things like virus scanning, file format identification, characterization, validation, and normalization, and recording all of the results of these actions in a very standardized way. 
and I'll talk more about that during, during these slides today. You also optionally can create dissemination information packages or DIPs to populate access systems and the access systems that we have workflows that work between Archivematica and, Archive, and, um, uh, Archivematica, uh, and these access systems include Archivespace, um, Atom, and ContentDM. Um, Archivematica is supported and maintained by Artifactual Systems, so uh, it's open source, but Artifactual Systems is the business that maintains the code and provides a large amount of the, the maintenance and support, but it does have a large community of contributors, and that includes um, uh, a, um, a number of different vendors who supply uh, Archivematica services um, in various countries. It includes uh, users of Archivematica who contribute ideas and uh, bug reports and things like that, and also some community developers who contribute code to the project as well. Um, a question that we often get is, uh, what is the difference between Archivematica if you install it um, on your own versus Archivematica if it's installed for you through Archives Direct? And the answer is no difference at all. It is the same piece of software. So if you've been evaluating Archivematica and you're wondering if it will function the same way within the Archives Direct environment, the answer is yes. So what is JiraCloud? JiraCloud is the back end of Archives Direct, and uh, again, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But JiraCloud is an open source hosted preservation storage service that makes it easy to control where and how your organization preserves content in the cloud. JiraCloud enables your institution to store content with expert cloud storage providers while adding lightweight features that enable digital preservation, data access, and data sharing. So it's really value added storage as compared to just choosing uh, to store in a cloud-based service like Amazon like on your own. Um, JiraCloud offers you um, health checks and fixity checking and an interface to um, better understand the scope of your content. It's really built for digital preservationists, so it's a, a great back-end system to Archivematica. If you're familiar with Archivematica at all, you may know that Archivematica doesn't provide the storage in and of itself. It connects you to whatever storage it is that you're trying to use, and JiraCloud is a great option to work with, um, with, uh, with Archivematica, like peanut butter and jam. <laughs> Uh, so Archives Direct and you. So what kinds of things might you be hoping for if you're interested in the Archives Direct service? So Archives Direct offers a, a really quick startup. If you're ready to uh, like sign up for the service, we can get you up and running really, really fast. It's all hosted and web-based, so you don't have to perform any installation of... Um, oh, I'm just seeing that somebody says that they can't see the slides. Is that still the case? Have we... Um, have we addressed that? Can you see the slides, Christy? I can see the slides. Okay. Is the person who um, mentioned that in chat, can, are you still having that issue? Heather, are you able to see the slides okay? I can, Christy. Um, I'm wondering if maybe the person who has the issue might want to make sure that you're in full screen mode. Okay, give that a try if you um, if you haven't already, and hopefully that resolves it. Oh, she says she's she's in full screen mode. Tried all other views, and it's still there. Well, we'll share the slides. Uh, we can share the slides with you directly yeah. afterwards. Sorry yes. about that. Yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I can't think of any other uh, like configuration for me to change on my end. And uh, some other people are saying that they can see the slides okay. So hopefully it's not affecting too many people. Sorry about that. I'll try to be as descriptive as I can. <laughs> sorry about the big... Uh, <laughs> Apparently it's a big box that just says my name, <laughs> so that's not very helpful to be looking at. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so as I was saying, um, Archivestruct is, is all hosted and web-based. You don't have to install anything on your end, so um, that is a uh, bonus <laughs> in quite a few environments. Um, we often hear from um, 
from IT departments that they're they're looking for hosted solutions because they don't, they are no longer interested in in um, maintaining software on premise. Uh, uh, a lot of our IT is, is moving towards hosted software as a service base. So that's really what Archives Direct is. The only thing that you may need to have uh, locally would be an SFTP client, uh, which most people have, something like FileZilla or CyberDuck if you're using Macs. Um, most people have that um, by, um, uh, by default on their, on their desktop, so that's not usually an issue. Um, Archives Direct both, uh, so Archivematica uses open standards for all of the digital preservation work that it does. It stores your AIPs in bags and captures the digital preservation metadata as premise and nets. Um, th these are very open, widely understood and widely adopted standards and we think that that's pretty much your best bet for, for long-term digital preservation to, to capture your packages and your metadata in an open way that's that's widely adopted and widely understood. You have complete control over your content, obviously. You can log in at any time and, um, and get to it, download it, and so on. Um, it's content agnostic, so you can put any kind of digital content through Archivematica and store it in DuraCloud. What are the actions that Archivematica is able to take with it may vary depending on the type of content that you're um, that you're preserving, but uh, um, at the very least you can do um, bit level preservation, if not enhanced preservation on any type of content. Um, by using Archives Direct, you become really part of this open source community and you're using open source software, if that's something that's important to you. You do not have any vendor or content locked in. As I, uh, as I mentioned, the AIPs, the archival information packages that you're storing, are uh, in the bag format. If you needed to remove them from, uh, from the storage, from DuraCloud, because you want to go with another, another system or you uh, just want to preserve your, your content elsewhere, you can absolutely do that. And it's easy to do and the, um, the content is able to be understood by other systems because it's just a bag. It's not um, a complex or uh, proprietary format at all. Um, and there's quite a few configurations to meet your needs or your processes or your workflows or your content. Um, there's quite a few configuration options within um, Archivematica for dealing with different kinds of content. So you have some decisions that you get to make, like how do you want to deal with um, zipped packages or disk images or how do you want to deal with certain kinds of content. Um, there's a lot of configuration that you can do and part of the support and training is that we help you understand what your options are and talk you through. The, uh, the workflows that you may need to, to um, perform. So the front end of, Arch of Archives Direct is uh, Archivematica, and what Archivematica provides is configurable OIAS-based workflows. So if you've used the uh, Archivematica before, given it maybe a trial run, then you'll see that it's, it's kind of visually very based on the Open Archival Information System reference model. Um, Archivematica performs preservation microservices, and as I was just mentioning, many of these are configurable based on file format information. So one of the first things that Archivematica does when it receives new content is identifies the file format, and then it will key off of that a bunch of preservation actions after that. So when it encounters um, an audiovisual file, for example, it uses certain tools to do things like characterization and metadata extraction and normalization and so on. But you get to configure those if you want to. You can either use it using the defaults upon installation or you can do configuration on your own. Uh, normalization is um, Archivematica's primary way of uh, preserving file formats, of addressing file formats preservation for the long term. And again, this is configurable by you if you so choose. You can choose not to normalize if you are dealing with content that you feel is in a file format that needs no normalization. So for example, if you're storing TIFF files, you probably don't really have a need to normalize that content. But if you're storing other types of files that you choose to normalize into either uh, formats for preservation or for access, there's configurations that you can do to, to, uh, to do that on many file formats. Um, and it's, um, as I've already mentioned, very standards compliant. So if you're concerned with um, making sure that you're capturing your digital preservation efforts in a standard compliant way so that your, um, your packages can be accessed in the future by other systems and using um, 
uh, standards that are open. We use premise embeds to capture the, the digital preservation um, actions and all of the, the characterization of the files that, that we're able to get. And uh, we use Bagit or the bags as the, um, the way of packaging up the, uh, the AIPs. Uh, the back end is JuraCloud, and JuraCloud is offering you replicated storage in two geographically dispersed locations. Um, integrity checking services, so it regularly does fixity checks just on its own. You don't have to prompt it to do so, and you can check the reports to make sure that everything is okay. And you can download your content at, at any time. So um, in terms of if you're wondering about like how much does this cost? This is the, the basic pricing. So um, by our sort of standard offerings are, are two different packages. You can do a digital preservation assessment uh, for a th three month pilot to basically um, get your feet wet and see if the service really works for you without making a huge financial investment. And it comes with all of the training and support and consulting that you need to, um, to be successful at that. If you're ready to, if you're like, yep, this is good for us, this is what we want to do, um, the standard offering is um, 10,000 a year. And that includes one installation of Archives Direct, so one like one Archivematica pipeline connecting to one uh, Jura Cloud um, storage space, um, uh, which can be configured in different ways. Um, and that's one terabyte, but if you need extra storage, that's available too. And again, all of the training, consulting, and support that you need to be successful. We want to see you uh, perform your digital preservation in a way that is working for you. So we, we want to give you the support that you need. And if you're working at like a bigger kind of scale or you have different kinds of needs or you want to include an access system, like you'd like to have um, an installation of Atom, for example, as part of your, um, as part of your Archives Direct service, then we can do custom quotes on that kind of thing. So now I'm going to do a, a, a walkthrough of the workflow. So like, what does it look like to actually use the system? Um, so if you're familiar with Archivematica at all, then, then this will look quite familiar. Um, and if you're not, this will give you kind of a taste of how it works. I'm just using screenshots, I'm not doing a live demo, um, but hopefully this will answer some of your questions. So the first step is to make the material available to the installation of Archivematica to process to begin with. So typically what we do is we set up an SFTP space and most uh, folks have no problem using that. Um, SFTP is really widely supported and it's probably something that you have installed on your work desktop. So basically you would be creating um, transfers that you want to process through Archivematica. So you're gonna put the content that you have into folders. So maybe it's like all of the files that were generated during a digitization project, or um, maybe it's like broken down a little bit more finely because the files are very large and that's how you wanna structure your apes or whatever. Um, so first you populate this transfer source location. Then the material becomes available for um, processing in Archivematica, and you can choose different types of transfers. So you can do a standard transfer, which is just um, files and directories. It doesn't matter how it's structured, but we also have special workflows for DSpace exports, if you are preserving content that's being exported out of DSpace. Um, if you have uh, disk images, then those can be, uh, there's a special workflow for those as well. And also bags. So if you have zipped or unzipped bags uh, that you've already bagged your content in another system, it's kind of a value added workflow because Archivematica will verify the bag and make sure that the checksums check and all that kind of thing before it continues processing. Then the content makes its way through the initial micro preservation microservices, and this is the uh, what we call transfer in Archivematica. So this is sort of the basics of your preservation workflow. So things like um, scanning for viruses, assigning file UUIDs and checksums if they don't already exist. It can also verify existing checksums if they do exist. Scan, uh, scanning for viruses, um, identifying the file formats, characterizing the files, validating the files, and some other microservices in there as well. And at the end of this process, you have the choice of either sending your material to a backlog, um, so that's one option for you. You can send it to a backlog and uh, do continue the processing in the future. Using the backlog functionality also allows you to analyze and view and arrange the content through this tab that's called the appraisal tab. Um, so there's different workflows that you can do here. You can bring up a list of all of the files. You can apply tags to them, which is really just like a, a temporary marker, like imagine like a, like a digital post-it note to say like, 
oh, I, you know, I see this, this content includes a bunch of, you know, images or whatever, and you want to like tag things in a certain way just so that you start to sort of see your, your archival arrangement if you're doing that kind of work. Um, this part of the workflow, this is optional and it's rather manual, but it's sort of intended for um, born digital workflows where you might have a lot of analysis to do and you might be putting content through like a disk image that you haven't really had an opportunity to explore outside of the environment. So imagine you've received material from a donor and you're putting it through the system, um, but you want to know kind of what you have before you finalize what, you know, you may want to not keep it all, for example. <laughs> so that's one option. The other option um, is to just uh, send the material directly to the ingest tab where the preservation microservices continue. So whether or not you've used this like backlog appraisal functionality in between, or you can skip right from transfer to ingest. And this that skipping is um, sometimes relevant for any workflow, but it would be particularly relevant, I think, for workflows where you're, you already know what you're preserving. So maybe it's a digitized content maybe it's um, exports from a, uh, an institutional repository like DSpace. Um, so there's no need to kind of view it and arrange it and appraise it. You just sort of want to continue the process and, and get it going. So it's during the ingest tab that um, Archivematica performs the normalization process. And that's where you get to make a decision about whether you want to normalize the copies in your AIP or just preserve the originals. Archivematica always preserves the original files in the archival information package, uh, regardless of what you choose for normalization. So if you choose to normalize for preservation, you might have an original file and a normalized file. If you choose to uh, just preserve the originals, then you'll just have the originals, but the originals are always there. Normalization is also where you choose whether or not you want to make a dissemination information package or a dip. So if you're populating an access system um, like um, Atom or ContentDM or something like that, and you want to um, and you want Archivematica to make the access files for you, you can do that. Um, so again, like it really depends on the file formats that you're ingesting to begin with. Um, we are uh, Archivematica is a completely open source stack, so we're reliant on open source tools to do all of this normalization work behind the scenes. Archivematica itself isn't doing it; it's calling upon tools like FFmpeg or ImageMagick or GhostScript to do its its normalization work. So for some file formats, there just isn't an open source tool that does um, that normalization work. So for some files that you put through you won't get a normalized version at all, but you can still make a dip if you choose to, it'll just make a copy of the original. So for example, if your original content is a bunch of Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, there's no normalization rule or command within Archivematica for that because there aren't any uh, tools that do that well. So um, it just, um, it, it'll just keep the original in the AIP and it will make a copy of the, the original for the dip as well. Um, so normalization is kind of an important step in Archivematica because it's um, both your kind of decision making about an ape and a dip or whether or if you just want an ape, all workflows in Archivematica end in an AIP um, unless you like reject or, or um, fail the, 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 um, the submission information package at any point. But the, basically the assumption is that your, all workflows should result in an AIP and only some of them result in a dip. That's sort of an optional workflow. Um, so at the end of the, uh, the process in ingest, then you have uh, successfully stored an ape and the dip may be uploaded and or stored. You can also just make copies of dips and store them in a location if you so choose. Um, or you could do an upload to Atom or, or ContentDM or ArchivesSpace. And I say upload, but those workflows all work slightly differently. So if you have questions about a specific access system, feel free to pop that in Q&A at the end. So once you have your stored apes, they can be searched and viewed through the archival storage tab. Um, so if you down the line need access to this content, you kind of, you have sort of two options. You can either use Archivematica's archival storage tab, or you could also access them through the, the Jura Cloud interface as well. 
This screen is showing how you can pre-configure microservices so that the content is processed automatically. So there's different configuration options within Archivematica, and you can have it so that all of the, the microservices just run pretty much automatically, like without any intervention from you at all. You just kind of kick off a transfer and away it goes. Um, or you can have it stop at certain points so that um, you can make a decision on the fly. So maybe some of your content needs a certain kind of action or tool. Some of your content doesn't need that action or tool and you want to like uh, um, have it run in a more manual way so that you can take your time and make those decisions as you go. Both things are possible and both are totally valid ways to use the system. So there's other um, more uh, specialized or complex workflows that um, I didn't touch on in that workflow walkthrough, but some of the possible ones, you can, pre you can give Archivematica predetermined preservation, access, and service files. Service files meaning like mezzanine files, they're called sometimes things, that, files that are, have been, um, you know, maybe uh, cropped or color corrected or uh, altered in some way. So if you already have preservation and access files and you just want Archivematica to do the packaging, you, there's ways that you can pre-configure your transfer so that you can say, uh, you know, use these files to make the A, use these files to make the DIP. Um, sometimes that comes up if you've been, uh, like maybe you've been doing digitization projects and you've done your own conversions outside the system, or you've, you're working with a vendor for digitization and they've provided you with tips and JPEGs. You want to use JPEGs for your DIP and TIFFs for your APE. Um, you can include descriptive and rights metadata, and there's different ways that you can do that. You can do it within the Archivematica screen, or you can include CSV files with your transfer so that you have like um, uh, the descriptive um, metadata that's supported is Dublin Core, and the rights metadata that's supported is premise. Uh, you can manage data sets and accruals and relate preserved content to each other in version archival packages using what's called the AIC concept. So that's an archival information collection. Um, so basically, if you have, say, a, a collection of things like a, a you know, a, 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 a archival collection that's very large and you don't want to store it, it's not really appropriate to store it all in one AIP. You sort of want to split it up amongst the IPs, but you still want to relate the content together somehow. Uh, there's a way in Archivematica to create what's called an AIC, and it basically just creates like some wrapper metadata that uh, in a METS file that relates all this all of the content together. Um, while you're doing processing, you can view the the results of normalization uh, through reports and by downloading the files uh, within your browser. So if you are unsure of what the results of normalization are going to look like, if you're not familiar with the type of files that you've ingested into the system, then you can take a pause there and just kind of see the results before you continue to process on and finalize your AIP. You can set your own preservation policies what's called the, with what's called the FPR or the Format Policy Registry. So I've mentioned this a couple of times now that you can basically you can tell Archivematica when you encounter certain types of files, please take certain types of actions. Um, a relatively recent development, you can check media specific policies using a tool called MediaConf. Um, that is a tool that is uh, an open source tool, like everything that's used in Archivematica. And um, you can build out policies um, for particularly for audiovisual material to say, you know, like I, we have a, a maybe a local rule that says all of our content has to meet a certain aspect ratio or color information or something like that. You can build out that policy in MediaCrunch, which is a, like a separate tool, but then have it checked within Archive Matica. And then you can do, um, I've mentioned this a couple times also, but you can do uh, dip uploads to Archive Space or Atom or ContentDM. Each of those workflows look a little bit differently. Um, the, uh, with ContentDM, you're just sort of preparing a dip that would be used by ContentDM, would be ingested by ContentDM. Um, Atom receives the entire dip from Archivematica. Atom, if you're not familiar, is an acronym for Access to Memory. It's an archival description and management system that we develop here at Artifactual Systems as well. And with ArchivesSpace, basically you can send the metadata to ArchivesSpace because ArchivesSpace doesn't actually host digital objects itself. But you can configure um, Archivematica to send the metadata about the DIP to ArchivesSpace. So at this point, I'm going to um, pass the mic virtually <laughs> over to Heather. I'm going to keep, uh, I can, um, 
uh, progress the screen when you're finished though, Heather, so just let me know and, and Heather's going to talk to you a little bit about other Jurispace services. Thanks so much, Sarah. So I'm just going to quickly review the other services that DuraSpace offers and how they differ from Archives Direct. So the backbone of all the DuraSpace hosted services is DuraCloud, which Sarah mentioned earlier. So DuraCloud is an open source hosted digital preservation service. So what that means is it lets you store content with cloud storage providers, so like Amazon Web Services but adds features like regular bit integrity health reports and an easy upload tool and annual billing. So DuraCloud can store any type of file and it integrates not only with Archivematica, but with DSpace, with Fedora-based systems and with the Internet Archives Archivit tool. There's several storage provider options for DuraCloud, including a track certified Chronopolis Dark Archive network. That's a really economical option if you have items that really need long-term dark storage. And DuraCloud is accessible at any stage of your digital preservation planning. So if you wanted to subscribe to just one terabyte of storage, that would be um, starting at under $2,000 a year. And then there's special pricing if you're going to store a lot. So if you're going to store 20 or more terabytes in DuraCloud. So DuraCloud provides the cloud preservation storage for those AIPs and those dips that you create in Archives Direct but it doesn't provide all of that standards-based preservation services, so all of the things that Sarah reviewed. Um, that comes with the Archivematica piece of Archives Direct. But if you just need preservation storage, DuraCloud is also available as a standalone store, um, storage option. So the other service I wanted to highlight is DSpace Direct. DSpace Direct is a very lightweight hosted DSpace repository. So DSpace Direct is the right choice if what you're looking for is a simple way to organize content and to make your content accessible via a public-facing interface. So DSpace Direct also does not include any standards-based processing like what you get from Archives Direct, but it does include automatic backup of all your repository content to DuraCloud. Um, the other nice feature with DSpace Direct for a hosted DSpace repository is, while it's a very simple and non-custom and straightforward version of DSpace, when you're ready to move to a more custom kind of repository, it's very easy to migrate all of your content to a more custom hosted provider or to your local repository environment. So that's sort of the, the differences. The Archives Direct is really focused on those preservation microservices, DuraCloud is just the preservation storage layer, and then DSpace Direct is for when you want to make, um, a, make a repository available, make that content available uh, in an easy and simple way. So those are the services that we offer through DuraSpace, um, and we're really excited to be part partnering with Artifactual Systems for Archives Direct, because as you heard from Sarah, they're really the experts in that tool. Um, we can advance the slide, and I'm going to hand things back to Christy, because we're going to move into the Q&A portion now of the webinar. All right. Well, I would like to thank both of you for your presentation today. And now it is the, the turn of our, our attendees. What questions do you have for our speakers, um, whether it be something on our, in Archives Direct or a, a DuraCloud question? Feel free to use the Q&A window located at the bottom of your menu, and you can go ahead and type in your question. And while folks are typing in their questions, I'll just mention that DuraSpace Services will have an exhibit table at the DLF Forum and NDSA's Digital Preservation 2018, which is coming up uh, October 15th through 18th in Las Vegas. So if you or anyone from your institution will be attending, please stop by and say hello. Um, and we'd love to talk to you more about Archives Direct or other DuraSpace services. Thanks, Heather. We have our first question. Um, can you tell me where the DuraSpace servers are located geographically? Sure, absolutely. So DuraSpace doesn't have any servers. Well, we use DuraCloud to connect with expert cloud storage providers. Um, and there you have a lot of different options depending on, on what you need. But most of the time, and when what comes standard with Archives Direct, is Amazon S3 storage. 
which is um, we use the Virginia based storage provider um, version of AWS S3 and you also have a secondary backup to Amazon Glacier storage. That's the secondary provider. Um, Amazon does not make it publicly known. We know that there are at least three copies and that they are geographically distributed in the United States, but they don't uh, make it known exactly where. Uh, but we do know that it's in the Eastern United States. Um, another option for storage is the Chronopolis Dark Archive. Uh, the Chronopolis Dark Archive is a completely um, not-for-profit not institution-based dark archive, and we do know where all of those servers are located. So they're uh, um, located across the U.S. So there's one at UC San Diego, uh, one in Colorado, one in Texas, and one in Maryland. So for that option, we do know exactly where those servers are located. Okay, another question for you, Heather. Does DuraCloud have a file size limit for uploads? That's a great question. Um, DuraCloud has to chunk files over um, one gig. So they'll be chunked and then stitched back together to move into, um, into storage. But there is no limit on, on file size. So if you had very large videos, uh, they would end up being chunked and stitched, uh, but they would still go through a bit integrity check to ensure that they were stitched on the other side when they reach cloud storage. But there, there's no limit. Um, on the size of files, and there's no limit on how many terabytes you can put in storage. Excellent. We have another question. I am interested in how scalable this solution is. Do you already have any large clients? Um, for example, this person is from a government agency. Um, that's a great question. I guess it depends on your, your definition of large. Sarah, I don't know if you want to speak to um, scalability. So the scalability of the tools that are involved in Archives Direct, um, you know, there's there's no limit to how much storage you can use with um, with DuraCloud, and Archivematica can process any amount. Um, I believe the largest Archives Direct customer right now has twenty, maybe twenty six terabytes available. I'm not sure if they've used all of that already. Um, but I, there's no limitations that I'm aware of to, to the system. Um, sorry, I'll just jump in. I was muted. <laughs> now I'm unmuted so I can jump in. Um, so I want to address both this question as well as the previous question about file size limits. Um, because while JuraCloud doesn't have a file size, your, um, your archives direct uh, your Archivematica dashboard would, would need to be configured in a way that uh, can be figured appropriately for the file of size, the size of files that you want to process. So Archivematica does all kinds of work um, in the um, in its uh, processing spaces, and if it's not configured with enough space, then you're you will have failures. So it's always good to talk to us about what your needs are so that we can configure it appropriately. We sort of have to like hit a middle of the road. So we will um, try to, uh, like when on installation, if we don't have any other information, then we will just kind of give it a, um, uh, give it a um, kind of an approach, like a somewhat appropriate um, middle of the road processing space. But if you're dealing with, for example, very large video files, that would be a good thing to talk to us about so that we can make sure that you're set up for success from the, the get go. Um, but uh, generally, like there's not, as Heather said, there's not really a file size limit. And it's the same kind of question for scalability. It really, I mean, it depends on um, uh, like largeness of processing can have different definitions. So if you're trying to process a lot at one time, or you want to process a lot in a given span of time, those are kind of two different questions. And at a very large scale, such as a government, uh, body, we would probably want to talk to you um, in advance about what your needs are and make a recommendation of a configuration that might work for you. So um, I would say like the short answer to that is like the, uh, the standard like $10,000 a year offering would probably not be appropriate for like very, very large scale processing. We would want to recommend something more appropriately sized. Um, with maybe multiple installations, like multiple Archivematica dashboards running at one time. 
um, and have the appropriate storage space for you too. I hope that helps answer that question. Okay, we have a question in the chat window that I'm gonna go ahead and ask you now, Sarah. Does Artifactual have any consortial customers sharing one instance of a repository system? Um, does, uh, sorry, does Artifactual have any customers sharing an instance of a repository system? Um, I think the question may be if there is a consortial customer for Archives Direct. Okay, because, because, uh, um, no, no, I don't think so. Not but at the moment, there isn't. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> consortial customer sharing one instance of the system. So, um, so if I, you're a repository system, so the repository system would be DSpace Direct. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and we, uh, let me think. So if, you, if you're really referring to a repository system, we don't have any that are using DSpace Direct at the moment, but that is absolutely something that would be possible. Um, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about that directly. Um, we also don't have any consortial users for Archives Direct. So if you were thinking about Archives Direct for consortial use, um, that's a really good question. Sarah, have you worked with consortia for um, with the Archivematica side of that? Um, only, only consortiums that each, uh, like uh, they've sort of partnered together for a cost savings, but they each have their own um, installation of Archivematica. Archivematica doesn't have a, um, Archivematica doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have an ability to make logins with different permissions to see different files. So anybody with a login to your Archivematica dashboard, which should only be people who work at your um, at your institution, <laughs> um, would be able to access any AIPs that have been stored, um, at least in, in Archivematica's current um, installation. Um, so that may be an issue for you if you're concerned about like privacy concerns or something like that. That's the, kind of the biggest issue that I can think of with consortial use. Um, usually when we've worked with consortiums, it's more of a, uh, like a partnering together to get like kind of a bulk rate and to, um, to negotiate with us a, a, a good um, rate for a hosted system for each institution to have their own hosted system. Okay. Thank you both. Is it possible to link with secure storage in Canada? Can I jump on this one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, um, I don't believe there. I don't believe it's possible for JuraCloud to use storage in Canada. Is that right, Heather? We're actually exploring that possibility right now. Okay. Um, but at, at the moment, it isn't. But it's something that may be coming down the line very soon. But I know that there's you. You're, you would also be aware of other options in Canada, Sarah. Yeah, so we, um, for Canadians on the call, and I know there's a couple, um, there's a service through the Canadian Council of Archives, the, uh, it's called the Archives Canada Digital Preservation Service, and that would currently, uh, at least at this moment in time, be our recommendation for a hosted Archivematica service in Canada, because the storage is in Canada. That's a legal requirement for public bodies in Canada, for anybody on the call who's wondering why Canadians care <laughs> about the storage location. <laughs> And is it possible to schedule archives direct submissions for a future time? So for example, overnight? Um, we could work with we could work with clients on something like this, I think. I would need to consult with our support team here, but I think like we there's a um, there's a suite of tools outside of, of Archivematica called the um, automation tools. It's not um, included by standard in your Archives Direct um, subscription, but it's the kind of thing that like we could um, discuss a custom quote to add on, and then there could be like a cron job for um, for starting transfers up um, automatically. Uh, the only by with a standard Archives Direct installation with like no other kind of like additional tooling around it, my recommendation would be to start your transfer at the end of the day, <laughs> and then it will run overnight. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, uh, manu a bit of a manual and a bit of a, a lightweight and simple solution, but one that might work. <laughs> and I'll just jump in here um, to add, Sarah. Sarah mentioned that, you know, a standard Archives Direct subscription. 
Um, oftentimes, especially initially, um, this is the, the benefit of archives direct with getting to work directly with someone at, at Artifactual to work out your workflow and figure out what you need. Um, you can add you can add things onto that subscription uh, temporarily or permanently. So not just adding more storage, but adding more processing pipelines temporarily to get through a backlog or there's all kinds of things you can add in. You can add in the ATM. Um, there's a lot of customization options that you can uh, work with the folks at Artifactual to figure out exactly what you need. And for the participants on this call, if they were interested in um, learning more about Archives Direct or getting a quote for the service that would meet their needs, at least what they know at this time, how would they go about doing that? It's a great question. You can go to the website, the duraspace.org slash archives direct has a lot of information or you can reach out to us directly, um, info at archivesdirect.org and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Or you can reach out to the, the, the um, slide here has my direct contact information as well as Sarah's. Do we have any final questions from our audience? Heather, Sarah, do you have any last words of wisdoms, wis, words of wisdom to share? Uh, I don't, um, but please feel free to reach out with any questions. I know sometimes it takes a really long time for institutions to implement a hosted service. There's a lot of planning and there's a lot of budgeting. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, and we're well aware of that and we're happy to talk to you at, at any stage in your decision making process or in your planning process to, to help you uh, figure out what you might need. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And I would just echo that, that we're always really happy to talk and um, and to kind of start the process with you, even if you're very unsure of, of what your long-term plans are, we're absolutely happy to uh, to answer your questions and to, to see if it's a good service, a good fit for what you need to do. All right. Well, I would like to thank everybody for being with us today and a very special thanks on behalf of Duraspace to both Sarah and Heather for sharing their knowledge with all of us. This concludes our session today. As I mentioned earlier, the web, I'm sorry, the webinar and presentation slides will be available at Duras, duraspace.org, and you will be sent an email with the links to that um, by the end of the day tomorrow. So thanks again once for once again for being here, and please enjoy the rest of your day.